to call back to the podium for encore performances, Dr. Clarissa Kripke, who's clinical professor of family and community medicine and director of the developmental primary care unit at UCSF. The mission of the Office of Developmental Primary Care, founded by Clarissa, is to build the capacity of the healthcare system to serve transition age youth and adults with developmental disabilities through clinical service, advocacy, research, and training. And I could say a lot more good things about Dr. Kripke, but um, I need to say some really good things about Dr. Dr. Dora Raymaker, who earned her PhD since the last time Dora presented here. And so she is a, a research assistant professor at Portland State University's Regional Research Institute for Human Services. I have to read all of this because it's so impressive. She's conducting community-engaged research with disability and mental health communities around employment, health, and anti-stigma. Dora's also an autistic person and a disability rights advocate who enjoys writing science fiction novels with disabled heroes in free time. So, and my goodness, you must not have a lot of free time with all those academic endeavors, but uh, we are certainly delighted that they are going to present on um, the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit, which Finn referred to earlier as something that is used with all of Finn's clients all the time. So let's hear about it. Thank you. Hi, so, um, so thank you. I'm a research assistant professor at Portland State University in the School of Social Work. I do social service intervention research with disability populations. I mainly work with people with intellectual disabilities, autistic people, and people who uh, experience psychosis and mental health challenges. And uh, I, my research is around employment, health. I, I have a pregnancy and uh, interpersonal violence, many things that I've heard today, and it, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> so I'm also the co-director for the Academic Autism Spectrum Partnership in Research and Education. That is the research group that created this toolkit. Um, and I am also an autistic self-advocacy, autistic self-advocacy, and disability rights advocate, you can see that from an early age, I kind of had some ideas about civil rights. So. <laughs> And I am uh, on the clinical faculty and run a consult service for people with complex developmental disabilities and provide primary care to people with complex disabilities. And, uh, and I am an academic partner of the Aspire Network that you'll hear about today. So before we get into the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit, I want to give a little background on the Aspire part. So. Um, as I co-founded Aspire with my physician researcher colleague, Christina Nicolaitis, all the way back in 2006, before I ever thought that I would get into health services research, and I was her partner from the autistic community. And we were trying to deal with the problem of lack of inclusion of autistic people in autism research. So Aspire is a team of academic researchers, autistic people, family members, healthcare providers, and disability professionals. And many of us, like myself, wear more than one of those hats. We're housed at Portland State University, and we partner with a number of both community-based and academic institutions. And our mission, however, for all these years has never changed, which is to equitably include autistic people in autism research that is relevant to the autistic community and creates positive change for people on the spectrum by our own priorities. So this toolkit is the result of a multi-year research project to improve healthcare access and quality for autistic adults. And some of you might remember that I was here seven years ago. <laughs> and uh, at that time when I spoke to you, we had collected our very first data on that project, but we hadn't done anything about what we had found yet. 
So I get to come back here and present this next chapter in the story of what we then, I'm gonna first tell you some more of what we found because there's a lot more of it and it's a lot more clean to present now. Um, and then what we did, did about it. So first I'll talk about the approach we took to making the toolkit, which is community-based participatory research which I assure you is useful for more than just research. Um, and then I'll go through the development of the toolkit and what we learned about healthcare for autistic adults from that process. And then I'll turn everything over to Clarissa for recommendations, tips, a demonstration, and some of the tools that she has also developed here. So we created the toolkit and conducted all the science behind it using this community-based participatory research approach. And I say approach because it's a way of doing research. It's not a method like a survey or an interview. And it was a response to the problems that marginalized people and communities have had with research, like unethical studies, not being included in research that was about them, research methods or results being invalid because the researchers didn't understand something really important about the community, study results that weren't important to the community or could even be harmful or stigmatizing. So the idea is to create an equitable partnership between researchers and members of a community. And this approach, like I say, works outside of research too, for example, in person-centered planning meetings or in developing an interactive website like the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit. Has nine guiding principles, which are to acknowledge the community as a unit of identity, to build on the strengths and resources in the community, to facilitate a collaborative, equitable partnership in all phases of the research, to foster co-learning and capacity building among all partners, to balance knowledge generation and intervention for the mutual benefit of all partners, to attend to both local and broader systems-wide perspectives, to develop systems using a cyclical and iterative approach so you're always reinventing yourselves, to disseminate results to all partners and to involve all partners in dissemination. So that's not just going into an academic journal. And to commit to long-term processes and group sustainability, because it takes a lot of work to do this at the beginning, but there's a really big payoff once everybody trusts each other and you've got processes that work well. So what does this look like in practice? Equitable does not mean everybody does the same thing. Like we're not going to, in insist that community members become statistics masters. And we're not going to insist that non-community academics suddenly know what it's like to have lived experience. It means that expertise, power, and learning is shared. So during all phases, the community keeps the research respectful, accessible, socially relevant, relevant to their community, while the academics make sure that it's scientifically sound and academically relevant so that when you have results, people will actually believe them when you go to advocate for policy or do something with them. Um, so for example, during the development stage, the community may ensure that the study's focus and design meets what the community prioritizes and what is helpful, while the academics make sure that it's rigorous and going to advance science or to improve clinical outcomes. So in order to do this, effectively process and structure are really important. Uh, power sharing is like an easy word to throw out and a really difficult thing to do. And everybody has to be actively involved in it. So it means that academics and people who have more privilege need to give up the power that they are used to automatically having. And community members also need to take power that they may be unused to having or ever being given. And trust is really hard to build. So we use a lot of structures and processes to try to help provide a foundation for that, including how to communicate in a way that privileges the community, how to make truly shared decisions, how to make the space safe to give feedback and adjust the group based on that feedback, and how all of these things happen will look really different depending on your group. I have, uh, you know, I have, I have Aspire. I also have a group of young adults who have experienced first episode psychosis. I have a, a broad developmental disabilities group that we worked with, all of these using this method. And what we've done has looked very, very different because of the specific individuals who are involved. This is a, a quick look at some of the strategies that Aspire uses. 
So to equalize communication, we use an email listserv and a text-based group chat. Um, some people on our team don't talk or use speech, some can't manage phone calls. We had somebody who was deaf for a long time. So that's the place where we found that everybody has the same communication and everyone's communication needs are met. And it's at time put the more privileged academics in the group as a disadvantage. I remember Christina early on saying, now I know what it feels like to be forced to communicate in a way that doesn't work well. Because she was so slow at typing and she didn't understand any of the social rules of the text chat that us in the community, we had been talking to each other through this for years. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to say that this was 2011 and I was invited to my first Aspire text chat and I was so excited and I participated very actively um, and then got the feedback that maybe it would be better if I didn't. Maybe it would be better if I, um, if I and the other academic partners uh, listened and, and just observed and then we would have a separate phone call for the academics who could speak in the jargon that we're comfortable in and, and you made it very comfortable by saying you know you have a way of communicating you have a way of thinking and that's important to this group but um, but ne'er the two shall meet um, uh, <laughs> um, with without specific facilitation um, so you, you know, even people who have a lot of experience, who are used to working with people with disabilities, who are used to talking to people with disabilities, um, this process takes that really seriously and makes us relearn what's, what's possible in a way that took it to a really different level. We let Cl Clarissa back into our text yeah. chat since yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we've all, I'm, I am also guilty, so, so sometimes we've had academics uh, or, or jargon be a problem for, for those of us who sit on the, 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 who wear multiple hats too, because early on one of our, our community members came to me and told me she was terrified every time she saw an email from me, <laughs> because it was so full of, of details <laughs> and science-y stuff. <laughs> So she, uh, she suggested a structured format for emails that we have used ever since, that's like been a decade now, that lists very explicitly the purpose of this email, who it's for, what actions should be taken, what the deadlines are, and then the details after that, <laughs> so that everybody knows what's expected from them. Um, and jargon absolutely needs to not be in anything or it needs to at least be explained. Because equalizing communication is, in my opinion, the foundation of shared power, and nothing else can happen without that. Oh, for shared decision making, we use this five finger, ooh, um, am I off a slide? I'm sorry about that. So uh, we use a five finger consensus process for decision making. Um, where the decision gets spelled out cleanly and then everyone indicates, one, I love it, two, it's fine, three, I have questions which are, four, I don't like it because, but I won't block it, and five, I hate it because, and I will block it. And then we discuss any threes, fours, and fives um, and make changes to the idea potentially based on that until everybody gives ones and twos or there are unresolvable fives, any unresolvable fives. So this has really helped us to make sure that everybody has the same amount of power in decision making because everybody has an equal veto um, and everybody has an equal chance to come up with a, you know to express what might be getting in the way and we've uh, had some really interesting things come of that so on one of my projects uh, we had we were actually using this process to decide if we wanted to use this process and one of the people there had given it a five, like she really hated it and didn't want to do it, but because you have to say why. She was somebody who had been in, in, incarcerated in an institution for most of her life and had been really infantilized and treated like a child. And she felt like holding up fingers was an incredibly childish thing and she wanted no part of it. So we decided that instead of holding up fingers, people would say what number they were. And she was totally fine with it, and we ended up using it through the rest of the project. So there are things that you might not understand about people if you don't have some process for understanding why they're making the decisions they are. So we, we love this. Um, 
we use it. So for feedback, we do a keep change exercise sometimes at the end of meetings. That helped a lot at the beginning when we didn't really know what we were doing. It became less helpful because now we just want to keep doing what we're doing. Um, but we do check-ins uh, when a lot of time has passed or there have been changes. And we've also used some confidential external evaluations in order to so people can speak more freely. We try to continuously improve how we work together. Accommodations are also at the heart of equalizing power and making a true collaboration. Um, and some of the, the what I talked about are all accommodations, but uh, these are some from some of our other meetings. We've had ASL interpreter. We've done pre-meetings where we meet one-on-one -on -one with somebody to explain what's going to be going on in the meeting so that they have some extra sort of ability to ask questions and figure stuff out. Um, personal assistance in meetings, sensory accommodations, extra processing time. Things go slower, but they go better. Um, alternate formats, um, attending to socioeconomic things like money for childcare or transportation can make it accessible. Um, but always ask your collaborators what works for them. So I'm a researcher, so I use this process in research, but it can certainly be used in other settings. So my project with um, ESA is a ESA is a program for young adults who have experienced first episode psychosis, and they have a young adult leadership council, which is the advisory board to the whole program. And there are some members of that advisory council who are also part of my research team. And they liked some of these processes so much that they brought them back to their advisory council and now use them for that. Um, also, you can use it to create products like the toolkit, um, accessible technology, anything like that, and the approach can be applied to person-centered planning or to shared decision-making in healthcare settings. As an academic partner of Aspire, I have deep respect for all that work that goes into inclusion, real inclusion and accommodations and making sure that no opinion and no participation is left behind. And I, one of my observations is how the rhythm of the work is different from most group processes that I've been in before, where you start, uh, you start often with a, a general idea and then drill down into, uh, into more specifics and, uh, and start with a draft and then, and then get something that is refined over time. But, uh, it, and it can feel like we're spending an enormous amount of resources, an enormous amount of time doing that inclusion and accommodation work, and it can feel nervous that we're not going to meet our deadline or we're not going to make our deliverable because we're spending so much time uh, figuring out all, all these accommodations. But, but there's a lot of thinking that happens when you have to explain something to really, really different people and have them all truly understand. And from the kinds of feedback and questions that you get as you, as you really take that time and, um, and take that time in your meetings to really uh, to bring everybody along. And, and then, but, but then at the, at the end, when you've done all that work and it comes time to really nail down what you're doing, it crystallizes really quickly, and we've met our deadlines, and we've met, it's been one of the most, we've, we've, we produce, it's been one of the most productive projects that I've been on. We've published quite a bit um, together, and, and when it crystallizes because of all that work, it's really solid. It really works, and when we study it, it actually improves people's lives. We we nail it um, because we've done all that work, and um, and so uh, it's it can look messy. It can make you nervous, but stick with it. Believe in it, because in the end, it it works. So now I'm going to go in this into the specifics of the toolkit development and what we learned about barriers to healthcare and healthcare experiences for autistic adults. So the first study we ever did was a survey on healthcare disparities between autistic and non-autistic adults. Um, and one of the measures on that survey was a 66 item yes no checklist with categories of transport 
Transportation, um, availability and access of service or system, insurance, uh, accommodation and access within facilities, social family and caregiver support, and individual level factors, which were things like finding the system, medical system too confusing or fear. And we had 209 autistic participants, um, 55 non-autistic but who identified as people with disabilities, and 173 non-autistic people who identified as not having disabilities uh, take it. And the autistic participants selected both different and greater barriers to healthcare, particularly in the areas of emotional regulation, patient provider communication, sensory sensitivity, and healthcare navigation, which is no surprise to you all. The top barriers, um, the top barrier uh, was fear or anxiety, which other groups rated high, but like just nowhere near to the same amount. Um, and then the second biggest barrier was unique to the autistic group, which was not being able to process information quickly enough to participate in real-time discussions and communications about health and healthcare with their providers. Um, other barriers were concern about cost, facilities causing sensory issues, and difficulty communicating with providers. So we considered accommodations for these and many of the other top barriers when we were putting together the toolkit. We then did semi-structured open-ended interviews with 39 autistic adults and 16 supporters. We wanted to understand their healthcare experiences and how to improve them. So we offered in-person, telephone, email, or text chat to try to accommodate the broadest amount of people we could. And seven years ago, I had preliminary results from that study, but here is the totality of what we've learned. So there's a dynamic interplay between patient and provider level factors. It's not like you can just fix something on the patient side or fix something on the provider side and have everything magically fall into place because the two are continuously interacting with each other. And all of that exists within a healthcare system. If the healthcare system can't support people's needs, then none of that matters. Um, so those three factors in their combination is what we heard about leading to people having greater or lesser success in their healthcare interactions. So these are, are some, in people's own words, to kind of give a little insight into what people might be experiencing when they come into your offices. So challenges in verbal communication skills were, uh, were common but differed in nature depending on the person. For example, one supporter described her son's literal interpretation of language. They asked him, on a level of one to 10, where is your pain? He said, um, how do you weigh your pain? An autistic participant described, it is always hard for me because I don't have the words that normal people have to communicate with. I don't always know how to respond properly to questions from healthcare providers. Sensory sensitivities were, of course, prominent. Both patients and supporters said sensory sensitivities impacted their patient's ability to have a healthcare interaction at all. One participant described, the lights in the office are very bright and it is exacerbated by the white walls. Sometimes the waiting rooms are crowded and I cannot filter out the background of people talking or shuffling magazines. I feel disoriented by being led down long hallways to different rooms. I am not able to bring up my concerns because it is all I can manage to figure out what the doctor is saying so I can respond to his questions. But he refills my usual meds and I go on my way. Participants described uh, challenges with body awareness as another dimension of sensory that um, is sometimes not thought about. For example, this participant explained, like when they ask if pain is shooting or stabbing or burning, it's like, I don't know, it just feels funny. Another explained, the problem is it is difficult for me to isolate specific sources of pain and identify duration and intensity. It's sort of equivalent to white noise. Many other known autism-related characteristics affected care, including patients' need for consistency, slow processing speed, atypical nonverbal communication, and the executive function organization stuff. For example, one participant explained, 
With my autism, it is very difficult for me to understand and follow all of the different appointments and procedures I have to schedule and how to do it. And no one will help me since apparently people magically become competent at these things before they turn 21. So looking now at the provider level factors and how those interacted with those patient level factors, autistic adults and supporters almost uniformly complained about providers' lack of knowledge of autism in adults, so I'm very happy that you are all here. <laughs> One participant described, I have gotten the distinct impression that all of the physicians I have seen have no clue what autism means or entails or how that should change how they treat me. Another states, I thought doctors would understand my autism. I thought saying, well, I have autism would be a suitable explanation for why I have age-inappropriate troubles with managing my health care, but it's not. Similarly, supporters related that they regularly had to teach providers about autism, including reminding them not to over-attribute behaviors to autism. One said, People attribute behaviors to the autism rather than looking for an illness first. Oh, that's her autism. She's banging her head against the wall because that's her autism. No one thinks, oh gosh, maybe she has a migraine. They forget to realize she can't verbally express it, so she uses behavior instead. Participants attributed many negative experiences with healthcare to providers having incorrect assumptions. For example, an autistic participant explained, I have used my AlphaSmart, which is a portable communication device, when my speech is too slow or difficult to understand for medical appointments. Some of the doctors have been really great, but others have acted really condescending when I used it, also immediately assuming I couldn't be alone, had to have parents there too. So I try to go without, even when my speech is in poorer shape. Another related, Usually when I demonstrate a large vocabulary or some fundamentals, my needs, especially around communication, are then ignored. My choice is then to pretend to be less intelligent and accept their infantilism, or to be confused, frustrated, and stressed out. Um, providers' willingness to allow patients to communicate in writing really was one of the reasons that patients felt that they um, received better or worse care. I prefer and find it easier to communicate in text, but with every doctor I speak to, they wave away the note card and look at me and ask the same question I have just answered and interpret my confusion as my being non-compliant with the medicine. I wish healthcare providers would read the notes I make for them. <laughs> providers often used to fa use accessible language. But they talk to him in the same words that they'd use if they were talking to me. If they're going to talk to him, they need to say it how he can understand it. Failure to communicate in an accessible way often led to decreased patient autonomy. Just because I might need more information to understand things, it doesn't mean they can or should just talk to me like a child or leave me without knowledge of my own health. My body is my body, and my experience and my wishes about my body are mine to make. And then openness to accommodations really influenced things. And they were very happy to accommodate all of her sensory and communication needs, including communicating with her by email ahead of time and giving her descriptions of who would be there, what the process would be, how long it would take. I believe they even supplied her with photographs of all of the staff and their names. Providers' skill at incorporating supporters also greatly influenced care. Both patients and supporters describe decreased patient autonomy due to healthcare providers communicating with supporters instead of patients. One autistic participant explained, the triage person kept speaking to the person who brought me rather than to me. The lady could have spoken directly to me. There were also examples from both patients and supporters of ineffective care due to providers not including supporters when they were needed and desired. Appropriate supporter involvement increased the patient's satisfaction with health care. For example, my mother would say the things or answer the things I don't know, like insurance things, and I would answer the other things. So remember that all of this dynamic is also being influenced by the environmental context in which it's happening. And the system level factors really surrounded and influenced that interplay of the patient and the provider. 
For example, experiences were often tied to the availability of supports as well as the complexity of the healthcare system. And many positive experiences had necessitated the help of family members or disability services professionals. And people who weren't getting sufficient services indicated that that was a reason why they weren't getting as good care. I wish they understood how easy it is to get confused with all the administrative hoops a patient has to jump through to get help. It sounds pathetic at my age, but I need someone to hold my hand. I don't know what I am doing, but no one understands that I need that, and there's definitely nobody willing to do it. I think this goes back to Finn's paperwork point. <laughs> The accessibility of facilities, of course, are a big deal. Really doesn't take a whole lot to modify things so that you can meet the needs of most people on the spectrum. Right now, these offices are set up for the physicians. They are not set up for the patients. Um, uh, and then, um, of course, there's a discrimination and stigma about autism, which was part of everything. Some autistic participants were very hesitant to disclose their diagnosis due to fear of discrimination. I'm very careful when it comes to disclosing my autism diagnosis to my healthcare providers because I fear it's gonna affect my healthcare. Others worried that providers would share common misconceptions about autism. And finally, the autistic participants in our sample noted challenges related to other societal issues that are well known to affect health, you know, basic self-determinants of health, which they often attributed to disability-related challenges in obtaining or sustaining employment. So then early on, we also uh, surveyed, uh, did a brief survey of 129 PCPs and found that while most of them felt uncomfortable taking care of people on the spectrum, and most of them had no plans to attend a CME like this, <laughs> Most of them would accept an autistic patient into their practice anyway. <laughs> However, they did say that they would um, look for information on the internet, that they would um, read a customized report, and that if a patient brought something to them, they would appreciate their effort. So that is um, really all together, all of those patient parts and that feedback from physicians is what went into the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit. So we developed it collaboratively using our CBPR process, as I described. Um, the content in the form was based on our study findings um, and from also the insight from the people with lived experience on our team. And that includes clinical lived experience. <laughs> um, and uh, it resulted in a website for both providers and patients with worksheets, checklists, resources, information, um, and then the Autism Healthcare Accommodations Tool, which is a place where patients, um, supporters, direct support providers, providers can go in and check off things that help accommodate, to help remove some of these barriers that we learned about. And then there's a computer program that translates all of that into doctor speak and puts it in a format that's then accessible to doctors because um, doctors need accessible formats. I, I went to see a neurologist about migraines once and I brought in a whole bunch of paperwork on like exactly what my accommodations were and all of these things about me. And I had an incredibly negative experience and I got nothing resolved and it was terrible. And Christina, uh, who's in internal medicine, the person who had an office next to her was saying, you know, gosh, my, my wife had this autistic person come into her office who brought in <laughs> this 10 page volume about everything and my wife was so overwhelmed and she had no idea what to do. So, <laughs> and that was me. So, <laughs> so our goal here was to take my 10 pages and to turn it into something that's not gonna terrify the neurologist. <laughs> Uh, so after, oh, I guess I should finish up. I got too excited with my story. So um, we did some testing of that. We did cognitive interviews to make sure that what we thought the language, the lay language meant was also we had autistic people as diverse a range as we could come look at it, tell us what they thought it said, um, and then we tested to make sure that it was reliable over time. 
Um, and we did a little evaluation of it that had both a, a numeric quantitative survey and some write-ins where people could tell us what they thought. One group of participants, um, we did a pre-post intervention design with the intervention being using the AHAT and the website. And it was in just real life. Um, the autistic patients, they completed the prevert survey either directly or with a, the help of a supporter. They used the AHAT to create a personalized accommodations report, and then they could choose whether for us to send it to their provider or not. Um, and then we gave them free access to the toolkit. And a month later, did a post survey, and our, our instruments were around like healthcare self efficacy, patient provider communication, healthcare utilization. We had questions about those barriers from that initial 66 list item. That's what we were looking at. We got a pretty diverse group of participants um, to take it, 170 of them. And we really were not expecting anything. It was a month. It was a month of a passive, passive intervention, and we thought like we were just testing to make sure people could answer our measures. But um, we got a really good, first of all, really good feedback in terms of that it was easy to understand, it was important, it was useful. Um, that people would recommend it to friends and providers, providers thought it was useful, that they would recommend it to patients. Um, and then most, most surprisingly, we found that there was actually a, a significant reduction in people's perceptions of their barriers to healthcare, their healthcare stuff, an increase in healthcare self-efficacy and an increase in patient provider communication. And we were like, this has to be a mistake. It was just a month. Um, but because we had the write-ins, we were able to really get some idea about why this actually made a difference in people's lives, even though there wasn't time for them to even see their doctor. Um, and one of the big things is that it gave a means for people to clarify and communicate their needs. So one of the participants said, filling out the survey helped me clarify some things which I was only vaguely aware. It also helped put into words things I'm unable to communicate because I cannot think of the right words. Um, and then it was also really validating to a lot of people who thought they were the only ones who were having these experiences or that they were somehow weak or deficient because they were having their experiences. So it, 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 it validated their experience and, and empowered them to be better self-advocates. Another participant said, it was validating. Previously, I felt that some of the things I was doing, like bringing support with me, was a sign of weakness. Now, I view it as a part of accommodation. It also gave me some ideas of things to try that I hadn't thought of. Um, it also improved self-efficacy by helping people prepare for visits and feel like they solid in what they were doing. It takes away a lot of my uncertainty about the appointments, whether I'll bring up everything I want to bring up, whether I ask the right questions about follow-up care, and being prepared for, ta for talking to new doctors. It's a game changer for me. Um, most did it voice enthusiasm about their effect on the provider? Y'all sent things to the doctor, so maybe this time he'll listen to me. <laughs> However, we, we did have um, a minority who voiced concerns about their PCP is not appreciating it or it possibly making things even worse. When I asked my psychiatrist to not use air fresheners, she said she had to or else her office smelled and she acted like it was a really big burden on her. I think that if I had handed her, your nice letter to my physicians, they would think I'm asking too much of them. I already stand out. I don't want to stand out more. They also left for us some examples of like actual change that happened in a month, which was pretty cool. I brought a copy of the accommodation letter in case he had not received it. He had, and it was already scanned and into, into his computer. He went over it with me and did what had been recommended. I was reassured that the doctor 
was taking the accommodation letter seriously. I felt like some of the difficulties I experienced were addressed and that they wouldn't have been had I not made use of the healthcare toolkit. I think the toolkit validated that my concerns and my daughter's issues, sensory, behavioral, et cetera, which often presented during medical appointments were typical for ASD patients and should be accommodated. So from the primary care providers, most did appreciate the toolkit's utility. Extremely helpful. What I needed were specific but concise suggestions regarding how to make my patient more comfortable. The report will be in her chart and I will use it at each visit. However, we did have some providers who just sort of poo-pooed it and said, oh, I don't need this because I already know my patient really well, which I don't know, might be the case. Um, and two providers said that they just didn't have time for it. So I am now going to pass my poor clicking off to Clarissa, who's going to tell you more about the toolkit itself and give you a tour. And So here it is. Use it. Um, <laughs> um, take a picture. Uh, uh, it's, um, there's a sample of an accommodation letter. There's a couple samples of accommodation letters in your packet so you can see what that looks like for the doctors. So here's what the toolkit looks like and how you can use it to improve care. It's primarily designed to assist healthcare providers, patients, and their supporters who are accessing care. It's split into two parts. There's a section targeted at patients and their supporters and another part for healthcare providers. It consists of information and worksheets and the interactive tool that we've been talking about that helps cre create the personalized accommodation report. The color themes and the font sizes can be changed to meet user needs and preferences, as well as an array of accessibility features. It has read aloud options. It's accessible to screen readers. It has ways to collapse and simplify information for less clutter and distraction. In other words, all that work that we put into learning how to work effectively with autistic people was built right into the structure of the tool and makes it a very different kind of website than, uh, than others that are on the market. The section on healthcare providers includes basic information on autism. It has tips for providing care discussions of legal and ethical considerations, such as how to uh, obtain informed consent and information on medical conditions and resources and links. And again, this is all uh, generated from this very robust process, uh, a collaborative process, so very much informed by people's learned experience as well as, uh, as, well as the academic input. The patients and supporters section has information on healthcare, staying healthy, rights, and it has checklists and worksheets to help people access and manage their healthcare. For example, there are tools to help walk people through the process of making an appointment, what to bring to an appointment, and worksheets to help people describe their symptoms. And, uh, and it, of course, it has the, the personalized accommodations report you can see at the top there. And when you go into that personalized accommodation report tool, here is an example of the kinds of questions there are. So this question is, what can help you make good decisions about your health care? And you can pick up to, oh, thanks. Um, you can pick up to three choices. So possible suggestions include things like, Give me very blunt and concrete examples of what could happen if I did or did not follow a recommendation. Or let me discuss my choices first with the person I trust and then come back to you. I think that's a really important point, not just from this tool, but in applying the processes that we were talking about with, with Dora um, and uh, about how 
people may not be able to participate in a healthcare appointment or in a person-centered planning meeting or in a research group or, or another group in real time. And so being able to step back and do some of the work in other settings can allow people to participate rather than just assuming that if they can't participate in real time that they can't participate at all. I think that's really important. Um, often, often people are worried that if they get an accommodation letter, it's going to have a lot of money associated with it. It's going to be difficult to implement uh, or complicated to implement. And sometimes people need things that cost money, and, and sometimes it does take time and effort, and I don't want to minimize that. But a lot of the most effective things are pretty simple and easy, and the trick is to know what they are, and, um, and you can actually save a lot of time and save a lot of money by, uh, by getting it right. And, The Office of Developmental Primary Care at UCSF isn't a research group, but we apply many of the same principles to our clinical and training work. And we also partner with stakeholders, uh, a variety of stakeholders, to create resources that are av also available free on our website. And there it is up there. You visit it. It's free. It's there for you. And I want to share some of those resources which are complementary to the toolkit. For example, we have a whole section on advice from self-advocates, so uh, one-pagers on sensory um, symptoms, on how to work with uh, people who accompany uh, us to our medical appointments, written by uh, Melissa Chris Cooper here. Uh, we're honored to have you here today. Um, we have more specific information than, uh, about how to access resources in California. Uh, the toolkit for Aspire is a, is a national project, whereas uh, our website has uh, California-specific information. And we have information on supported healthcare decision-making, on understanding aggression and self-injury, managing meltdowns, successful community living, and transition and also resources on communication access and, and much, much more. There's also um, uh, different tracking forms to track your health care, like seizures or bowel movements or other things. So there, there's a wealth of information there. I want to talk a little bit about our, one of our newer resources, which is communi on communication access. The, the most important accommodation for any appointment is communication. Communication is the foundation of patient care. Everybody communicates, find a way. Supporters are important and with permission can certainly provide a lot of information that's, that's helpful to supplement, but only a patient can tell you about their thoughts, feelings, and internal experiences and motivations. And I'll tell you a little story about this. I had an autistic patient who came in with her sister who didn't actually know her all that well because her mother had been providing her care and her mother passed away, um, unfortunately, before she, made, she, she assisted with making an accommodation letter because had she done that, we would have been in better shape. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the sister was very insistent that she could not provide me with a history. And she thought something was wrong, but she didn't know what. And, and she was non-speaking, and I didn't know how to communicate with her and had no information from her supporter. So I said, well, we don't know what's going on. Let's just try. So I just, I, I didn't know what to do, but I just started trying things. So I sat her in front of my computer to see if she'd type. And she did type, but nothing that I could interpret. And then I tried giving her choices. That didn't work. I pulled out, I have a, a bunch of anatomy pictures uh, and I pulled them out and flipped through the anatomy pictures to see if she would light up or point to anything. Um, and I said, show me how you say yes and observe carefully to see if she would make a sound or make a motion or make an expression that might help me to understand how she says yes and no. And that didn't work. So I just said, touch hurt. And she took my hand and she put it on her right upper quadrant. And based solely on that communication, I ordered a sonogram and she had gallstones. 
it's a really hard diagnosis to make without a history. Um, really hard history, if, in, and without her help, her sister didn't know. I would I would have never made that diagnosis without her help, um, and and so I I wouldn't say that that I always have success, but um, but my success rate is and all of our success rate is a lot higher when we try, and um, <laughs> um, so um, and and I'm and I'm often surprised. I'm often skeptical that my efforts will go anywhere and 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 more often than not they do and they do and just the, the effort sends a message to the patient that makes them try harder too so if you're not trying they're so used to being ignored they're so used to not having people engage like that that there's often a lot of learned helplessness and they can actually communicate a lot better than they typically do because they don't think anyone's listening so why would you try if you're if if you don't think anyone's paying attention. And also without some of that support, like touch hurt, uh, she, she might not have thought that I would have interpreted her. I might have, maybe she would have thought that she would have been afraid that I would interpret her taking my hand and putting it on her as, a, as an act of aggression or something like that and would have been too afraid to try. Um, so um, so uh, we have a, a tool, so, so some, Many patients come without a fluent form of expressive communication available to them. And this is our, one of our newest resources, which is a communication toolkit that was also developed in collaboration with self-advocates from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And it includes practical advice on how to recognize good communication supports, the components of a good assessment um, that take into account sensory, motor, and cognitive impairments, and it discusses how to choose an assessment professional and how to get supports uh, and assessments funded. So I hope you'll use that. And pass it on. So, uh, so thank you so much for listening to us at the very end of the day. Um, from this work, we've, we've learned that our CBPR process has resulted in a highly accessible and usable healthcare toolkit. Um, it has the potential to decrease barriers to healthcare, improve healthcare self-efficacy and patient provider communication. Um, we're currently testing it in some healthcare systems because we don't, even though things got better, that's not really good efficacy data yet. So we're working toward getting real efficacy data. Um, and changes might have been driven by changes in self-awareness and self-advocacy, um, as well as changes by patient and provider uh, behaviors or attitudes. So the implications, please use the, our toolkits. Um, they are available for free. Here, um, the tools may be helpful to other pa to patients with other disabilities or even just patients with low health literacy. There's a lot of, of teaching things about just how the healthcare system works on the site. Um, healthcare systems should find ways to incorporate these tools into their clinical practice. And other groups attempting to develop stuff of any sort for marginalized populations should consider using a CBPR approach. The big thank you to the Aspire team members who are really who made all of this happen, to the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, who's been our partner since almost day one, the Oregon Commission on Autism Spectrum Disorder, who um, was full of physicians who really helped us get the letter in a good format, all our study participants. Um, and I will, at this point, just leave the links and the tools and our contact info up. Um, we'd love to answer questions about anything you just heard or anything you'd like to ask us from our experience, um, any of my projects. Um, and I, I also have a novel coming out later this spring. So, um, so you can science fiction with a disabled heroine. So <laughs> you should look forward to that.